Recession. That is everyone's fear, and it should be, because a recession leaves everybody usually worse off. Sales for your products and services go down, your retirement wealth goes down, you might lose your job, your home, your car. Recessions are very difficult. They're highly stressful on people. Nobody wants to go into a recession. In 2007, the Federal Reserve gave us a formula for what could essentially self-fulfill a recession. They mentioned that there is some form of fear that begins in corporations and banks around the world. And once that fear translates into tightening, that is usually tightening in lending conditions, which that's just a fancy word for saying your credit card limit doesn't go up anymore. Your credit card limit actually might start going down. Banks become a little bit more reluctant to give you that home equity line of credit to finance that remodel on the home that you're now stuck in because you've locked in that 30-year fixed rate loan. And buy now, pay later products, which are newer as part of this generation, might start tightening their belt on either the fees they charge, that is charging more fees, making some things more unaffordable, or they ultimately just start saying no to a lot of different types of loans as institutions become a little bit more fearful that they don't want that kind of risky debt on their books. That recoiling against risky debt starts at the top. Those are all the big Wall Street boys and girls with all the billions of dollars. If they no longer want that, then companies start creating less of that kind of product. That is, they give less risky loans. They pull back, they tighten. So it always begins with fear, fear of something changing, something coming forward that really becomes a self-fulfilling start to a recession. When tightening begins, companies start seeing their earnings decline because they see less growth their goods and services just sell less than what they were selling the year before. Usually we call that an earnings recession. There could also be a growth recession, which is just when you have companies, let's say like uh, <laughs> artificial intelligence, that, that are growing at a rate of 100% or 50% per year, all of a sudden start growing at 5% per year or 2% per year. And then you have a growth recession, which tends to turn into an earnings recession. And so when you have these recessions at companies where all of a sudden their metrics are starting to indicate a slowdown, the next phase is a jobs recession because companies start saying, you know what, if we're not growing as fast, maybe we don't need to hire as many new employees. In fact, maybe we need to lay off some employees. And then as the world realizes they can do with maybe 10% less staff, those folks have to go work somewhere else but what happens if you can't go work somewhere else because job openings have collapsed? Companies are looking to hire less. Well, then you get into a jobs recession. This is where the price that employees are willing to work for actually goes down. So the value that they're willing to work for, the value they put on their own labor goes down. Now you start seeing people earn less and less. Well, what happens when people start earning less and start taking jobs for less? Well, people who are already in those jobs get fewer promotions because the companies can pay less and get a similar level of work. And if people leave making a higher level of wage, for example, somebody making $120,000 and a new person comes in doing uh, the same work for $80,000 because they couldn't find work somewhere else, this person's probably getting less of a pay bump. And if this person leaves, the company might be able to replace them with another person making $80,000, meaning now you've just saved $40,000. That's about a third that was just saved. Uh, and so this then all of a sudden reduces real income for people. And when people have less income, especially after all the crazy inflation we've seen, they spend less. So when we spend less, we start re-accelerating the fear of a slowdown. And this cycle is what becomes self-fulfilling. 
you had the fear, which led to some tightening, which led to some reduction in earnings growth or earnings, which led to some reduction in jobs, which led to some reduction in spending. Then the data after about six months or so comes back to the top. Oh my gosh, we were right. The numbers are getting worse. So they tighten more. That is how a recession self-fulfills. It's not unlike the story of the father who had a small gift shop outside of a highway on the highway heading to Vegas. And the only thing that advertised that gift shop on the way to Vegas were a series of billboards on the side of the freeway. And that kept them busy. People saw the billboard, were attracted by the billboard, and decided, you know what, I'm going to go shop at that store. And they'd get off the highway, get a snack, and they'd go to the gift shop, check it out. They'd bring business to the father's store. But the father's son, who had just graduated college with an economics degree, said, Father, don't you realize a recession is coming? We should prepare for a recession. And so the father taking the advice of its college-educated son, said, you know what, you're right, we need to cut. So the first thing they did is they cut the billboards that were bringing business to their business because they thought, well, we've got a good, loyal customer base. Let's get rid of some of that discretionary spending. Let's cut the billboards. So they cut advertising. And then wouldn't you know it, all of a sudden, sales and earnings went down. And as soon as sales and earnings went down, they had to lay off some of their staff. And then before you knew it, the father's going, wow, you're right. We must be going into a recession because now we've cut so much, we have to close the business. That's just an extreme example of how uh, recessions can self-fulfill. Obviously, don't cut your one lead magnet to your business. But this week is very, very important. Uh, and we're going to start by reviewing some of the catalysts that are occurring this week uh, so we can understand why uh, and, and what these earnings are supposed to tell us. Uh, this week will also be the start uh, of uh, the road show that we're doing. So if you'd like to meet me in person, uh, we're doing a road show between April 23rd to May 1st. And... Uh, I think we just had a little earthquake. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, April 23rd to May 1st, we're doing a road show. You can come meet us. We've got a bunch of different uh, locations. We've got 22 different cities we're going to in these eight days. So it's going to be a lot of traveling. I'd love for you to meet me. All you have to do is uh, go to metkevin.com slash roadshow. Uh, metkevin.com slash roadshow. And you can come join me. Keep in mind, this is for my real estate startup, house hack. So if you're uh, considering investing uh, in uh, a real estate startup, you're an accredited investor, go to metkevin.com slash roadshow. We'll have some uh, beautiful brochures and information for you and you can ask questions. It'll be a great opportunity. You can also go to the uh, House Hack Homes YouTube channel link down below so you can learn a little bit more about what we're going to talk about there. I go into depth there. But first, let's zoom out a little bit. Look at some, this is, just, this is just a list of some of the information that we're going to get this week. And I want you to think of each of these as not an individual company providing you earnings, but instead a group of companies giving you a direction of the consumer. What is the consumer's willingness to spend money? That is what we have to understand. See, we went through COVID where everybody had excess money. And the question became, what are people going to spend this excess money on? Well, of course, they're going to spend it on things that they can do at home. Uh, they'll order Chipotle burritos, they'll Netflix and chill, whatever. But now even Netflix last week warned us that, hey, you know, by the end of this year, we're not going to give guidance anymore for how many new users we're signing up on the platform. We'll, we'll just give you metrics on engagements. Hmm. That's very odd. That's a sign that maybe things are starting to chillax a little bit with user growth and people who would want to sign up may have already. And so a little bit of a red flag on the consumer, as well as the red flag we got last week on the consumer from banks. JP Morgan Wells, Fargo, Bank of America, and Citigroup all reported that their net charge-offs year over year, so from the beginning of 2023 to 2024, 
were 70 to over 100% greater than what they were last year. That's a double. So in other words, banks are saying, ah, we got some bad debt, write it off. Writing it off at twice the rate in some cases. That's scary. But maybe that is, is just the large banks. So what are we going to get this week? Well, we're going to get a lot of information. Like, for example, we're going to start getting some of the community banks reporting to us. Are the community banks also starting to see some of those loan losses accelerate? In which case, are they going to start tightening credit to minimize some of those losses? Are consumers still just as willing to remodel their homes because they're stuck in place? Or are we seeing paint sales go down as fewer people are actually transitioning in real estate? The real estate market has been saved by the 30-year fixed rate mortgage. We did have a correction at the end of 2022 and at the end of 2023. Uh, but they were certainly nominal relative to the level of it, what interest rates went up, right? Housing prices went down at peak, maybe 20%, maybe 10% at the end of 2023, and they've since recovered. The question is, how long can that hold? Well, that's really a topic for a different video, but it's going to come down to how many people become willing to move and what inventory levels do. If inventory levels skyrocket, prices will come down. But again, topic for a different video. This week, we're going to be focused on that consumer. Is the consumer just as willing when they stop at the gas station to purchase snacks and sodas at elevated prices? We are going to find that from our snack companies, our soda companies. This is what they talk about. Now, you might think this is crazy, but when gas prices were skyrocketing, Pepsi indicated, ah, we're actually seeing uh, people go to gas stations more often. So rather than fill up their tank 100% of the way, they'd fill up their tank half, and that would lead them to go to the gas station once, uh, and then obviously once again when they had to go fill it up half again, so you're going to the gas station twice as much, which actually increased sales at companies like Pepsi, <laughs> which is kind of remarkable because really what people have done here is they didn't actually save money by going to the gas station twice. They spent more by buying more stuff in the convenience store, and they also wasted their time by going to the gas station twice. But then again, when you look at any in and out line, let's just say there doesn't seem to be much desire for valuing people's time. But that's okay. What we're looking for is not a psychological lesson on money. We've got plenty of those in the Stocks and Psychology of Money group linked down below. Uh, new lectures posting tonight, by the way. Very, very cool for all uh, of our new course or members and existing course members. But we'll also find is people's capacity to respond to advertisements. Consider all the way down here at the bottom, we've got Snap, I actually wrote next, oh, I should write, I'll write it next to it, Roku. These are advertisers. How much are we actually seeing people buy Roku TVs? Usually a loss leader. Uh, what is that going to do to Roku's bottom line? Well, they'll probably lose more money. But what about advertisers? See, remember the sign example that I gave, the billboard example. What happens when advertisers start cutting on advertising and cutting on jobs because they're worried, they're fearful about a recession or people are becoming less responsive to their ads. Well, it doesn't matter how much AI went into your ad creation if ad dollar spending is going down. Facebook, Meta, will also be giving us some insight into what this ad spending is like. Keep in mind, Meta right now is buying as many chips as they could possibly get their hands on from NVIDIA for artificial intelligence-based servers, GPU-based servers, basically. These are going to be your uh, Microsofts, your Amazons, your Googles, your Meta. But the question is, which, by the way, we'll also get earnings from Microsoft, Google this week on top of Meta. And we're not going to get NVIDIA until another about 30 days. But what's remarkable is these companies will give us a leading indicator as well as a company like ServiceNow. Hey, we've spent these billions of dollars on AI chips. Are we actually able to make money? See, the Wall Street Journal recently suggested, why is it that companies seem to be willing to spend billions of dollars, yet they can't even prove that they can make millions of dollars with these AI chips? Now, it could be a sort of sales-based issue. For example, if you say you have artificial intelligence, GPU, uh, server stations, well, you're going to attract likely more people to your web-based services and your cloud services. And if you do it and your competitor doesn't, your competitor loses. So the competitors have to build out the same infrastructure. But what happens when that infrastructure is built out? 
Does a company like Tesla say, hey, you know what? We just bought 10,000 H100s. Are we going to now throw those H100s in the trash? And are we going to buy the next generation of NVIDIA's GPU chip? Blackwell is NVIDIA's latest and greatest chip that gets announced later this year. And there's this expectation that Blackwell might be able to process information for neural nets, let's say like for Tesla's full self-driving technology, potentially four times as quickly. Well, that means if Tesla doesn't buy the latest and greatest chips, another competitor, let's say they had the vehicle driving data, would only need 2,000 500 of such chips that Tesla has 10,000 of, which means they need one-fourth of the power. We're forgetting the commodity of power that goes into these chips. They would only need one-fourth the power and potentially do it faster to train a similar level of self-driving technology as Tesla has, assuming they had the data. Now, this is not a bag on Tesla video by, by no means at all. I don't think anybody has the data that Tesla does. Now, of course, companies like NVIDIA are trying to collect that data, uh, but uh, you know, you're know you using a whole lot of different vehicles to do so, and the consistency of that data may not be as perfect as Tesla, which has, as we know, very few models. The point, though, is we'll see from a company like Tesla, hey, are we going to buy that next generation of chips? Or did we build out our GPU server stack, and now we're good? That is what we're going to hear from Microsoft and Google as well, and it's going to be driven by how much money we can make, which we'll learn from companies like ServiceNow, Roku, and Snapchat. Of course, we'll also see some more generic information from consumers, like, hey, are consumers buying toys like they were previously? Well, I don't know. Mattel will tell us if consumers are buying toys like they were previously, or are children having to get fewer toys because people are starting to feel the squeeze. Remember, when a company like Disney reports, something that I like to look at is, what's the discretionary spending like at the parks? Because people will still go to Disney, but in a tougher economic time, they'll spend less per person when they're there. Sorry, no stuffies, we'll get it on Amazon, it's cheaper. Sorry, not paying 20 bucks to throw the sack three times because we know it's a scam anyway. <laughs> in a good time, people will pay the 20 bucks because it's part of the entertainment value. Bad time, people won't. You can see the same thing at companies like Royal Caribbean Cruise Lines, where the consumers will tell you, hey, look, we'll go on a cruise because we got to go somewhere. We're going to lose our freaking minds just sitting at home all day long. But damn, we, we're not going to do the excursions. No, we'll sit on the beach when that sucker docks. Okay, those are the discretionary spends that you will learn about from these companies. So far, it seems like the airlines, like JetBlue and American Airlines that are reporting this week, are holding up with their business class and their luxury style spend. In other words, the people willing to pay for first class. You're still seeing that spending. I expect to see that American Airlines and JetBlue. Uh, just like you're seeing it at American Express, which appeals to typically a higher credit, higher net worth individual. But that might not be so true for a company like Visa, who might show us a little bit more of a broad swath of the American consumer. Certainly, UPS would be very useful as a leading indicator for sales at companies like Amazon because, frankly, well, let's just say UPS delivers a lot of our packages. And when there's a recession, they tend to witness a slowdown very, very early. Well, let's just say UPS may have just gone through a big round of layoffs, but they got to prop up that bottom line because maybe that top line is getting hurt a little bit. Of course, we're going to see the autos. You know, we'll see a Ford report. We'll see Tesla report. We'll see Hilton, which also appeals to those business uh, customers. We'll see Verizon. I just canceled my Verizon service. They suck. Their customer service is trash. Sorry. Uh, AT&T report. We will also, uh, here's another auto. We'll see GM report. We're not, we're, we expect the interest rate sensitive stocks to do pretty poorly. Enphase, for example, lower guidance, lower sales mostly because interest rates are staying higher for longer. By now, we should have seen rate cuts already based on what people were expecting in December. Well, a lot of these stocks, well, at least Enphase, for example, has done better so far than it did at the end of last year when it was down at 70 bucks. Now it's somewhere around $109. But what happens when that was based on interest rates coming down this year and now it looks like they might not come down at all? 
Well, we'll see. We'll see just how interest rate sensitive they are. The one that never seems to fail is Chipotle. <laughs> now, this is an interesting one. I just ordered Chipotle yesterday. And uh, my goodness, three burritos, $19 a piece, kids' quesadilla, all in. It was like 90 bucks. Uh, it is remarkable. Clearly, the uh, willingness to pay for delicious, juicy meats and beans and rice with some guac on it. Uh, is, is quite high. They've got some pricing power. They've got large PP. Now, clearly we've seen over the last year, the companies we thought had large PP may not have, and other companies that we uh, also thought had large PP did end up having large PP. So for example, at the end of 2022, uh, I made uh, sort of a, a, a bet on which companies I thought had the largest pricing power, the largest PP. And the two bets that I made were on chips, basically a full investment into everything. Your uh, NVIDIA, this was back when it was like $130 a share, right? Your AMD, your ASMLs, uh, all of these. Uh, Taiwan Semiconductor, a little bit of Intel, you name it. And this obviously did exceptionally well, but boy, it was not helped by how long it's taken to get interest rate sensitives down. And so there was this giant anchor in the portfolio of companies like Enphase and Tesla, uh, as a result of us not getting rate cuts as soon as we had hoped. Now, things were looking good at the end of 2023 because we actually started seeing interest rates plummet. But now we're seeing a resurgence of inflation. And quite frankly, when we get our April inflation data, a lot of people are going to say even if April's inflation data comes in low, people are going to go back to the, well, one report doesn't make a trend. You're going to need two or three good inflation reports following three bad ones to actually help us get some hope of rate cuts coming again. And that's going to take some time. And so interest rate sensitives will probably be under a little bit of pressure for a little while longer. So the question now is, what do you do? Well, we know there's a lot of money sitting on the sidelines in money markets. I've been a big fan of trimming positions and going to cash since March. Uh, mostly because at the beginning of March, uh, the inflation dynamics changed so rapidly. And markets actually didn't react to it as quickly as I thought. Uh, markets uh, sort of took this approach of, ah, whatever, earnings are good, things are going good, let's keep going up. And, and I was sort of banging my head against the wall going, my gosh, these inflation numbers are so bad. Uh, the Federal Reserve is going to have to flip-flop from their December pivot. And eventually that will be bad for the stock market. And so I started increasing my... Uh, cash position and re reducing my exposure to uh, interest rate sensitives. Now, I'm not here to say I'm perfect with my portfolio. God, no, I'm anything but perfect. I'm just simply here to show you uh, the transparent bets that I make and the, the mistakes, uh, where I get it right and where I get it wrong. Uh, and the goal is to help you find some perspective on what to do maybe with your portfolio if you were looking to make any changes or just reiterate your positioning. But what I've done since March is I've increased my cash position substantially because I thought that at some point the Federal Reserve will matter again. At some point inflation and earnings will matter again. The fact that those things don't matter is a sign of a top for me, a local top. So I increased my cash position. Now we're finally starting to see a rollover of AI. Uh, at least we saw it last week. Who knows? Maybe this week we'll reiterate that no, 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 everything's going right back to the moon. Well, that's a very hopeful position, and that's okay, but at some point, which we have not done yet, we are going to reprice in the Federal Reserve. And by repricing in the Federal Reserve, both of these, at least recently, have been a down indicator. They've been downers. Again, maybe earnings this week will say the consumer is fine. But if we hear this week that the consumer is actually also going down, then Quite frankly, just the weight of the Fed and the consumer alone could lead the market to crack down further. I don't know what's going to happen. Again, a lot's going to be predicated on these earnings numbers or future reports on uh, inflation. But I'm concerned. So uh, my belief is that there will be plenty of an opportunity to uh, purchase cheaper equities and cheaper single-family homes. Right now, I think single-family homes are a broad ripoff. Uh, I bought single-family homes in October and November with my real estate startup. We did very well on those, I believe. Uh, but then we started seeing pricing go ridiculous. 
uh, it, to the point where it doesn't make sense anymore. Uh, what, what we look at, by the way, is the wedge, right? So we look at what we believe the after repair value of a property is uh, and what we could buy it for. And then obviously there's how much it takes to renovate it in there. Well, this right here is what we call the wedge, right? Our all-in versus the after repair value. And uh, usually in, in fearful markets, uh, so when you have fear, that wedge could be as high as I would say, uh, let's go with 150 to 200K uh, per $500,000 invested. That's sort of my metric. In uh, a, a normal market, that wedge is usually around 100K. And in a period of euphoria, which is very dangerous, those wedges become less than 50,000. Uh, and so while $100,000 wedges still exist today, there's a whole lot more of this going on, which is speculation on a strong spring housing market. And uh, that sort of speculation always scares me. So I think the same is true in stocks. There's just, there, there are going to be little periods of time where it's better to buy or worse to buy. And I think things barely off their all-time highs make for a little bit of a bad time to buy right now. So a little cash heavy, sitting in those money market funds. Uh, I could recommend a few. Uh, I don't have any connection to this one. I'm not even invested in this one, but I think it's a good one. VUSXX is a good money market. I am exposed to this one, VGXXX. That's uh, another money market. So you can get your yield, move in and out without having to do treasuries. Uh, and then, of course, uh, I mean, JPM's got one, but you could also look at things like a Robinhood Gold or, you know, some of the, uh, the fintech apps that are basically trying to buy your deposits. Uh, and that's good for them. They, they want growth and they want you investing and playing with options and all that. Uh, but anyway, uh, with all that said, make sure to visit me at The Roadshow, metkevin.com slash roadshow. Uh, it will be linked in the description down below. And uh, it's going to be incredible. We're, we're, I can't wait to meet a lot of you. It's going to be really fun. And um, we'll, we'll have an hour event together and it'll be totally free. So uh, take a peek at those. Make sure to RSVP so we can confirm exactly where we're going. We expect to go everywhere that's on the list right now, but obviously if, you know, in two or three days there's a location that has very few signups, uh, we, we, uh, you know, we might have to cancel the event. I don't think that's the case. Right now, based on the signups we have, it looks like we're going everywhere on that list. But you will get a confirmation email the day before uh, the event, so you have a very clear heads up that, yes, everything is Gucci. All right, folks, thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you in the next one. Again, that little spiel right there was just a reminder for you to please.